So first of all, a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's attending and everyone who's presenting today. Um, I know we we're in turbulent times right now, and um, in my opinion, these virtual events have made me feel more connected to people. Um, it gives me um, a chance to be part of something bigger than myself through citizen science. So I'm just really grateful that we're all able to be here and it's keeping me sane um, in these times. So I really appreciate it. Um, so today's event is part of Citizen Science Month, which runs all through April 2020. If you go to citizenscienceMonth.org, you'll be able to find virtual events pretty much every day of April. And no matter what, some sort of project that you can do from home are due while physically and socially distancing and following public health guidance. So Citizen Science Month is, uh, it's all virtual, it's all digital, but it's still impactful and it's still a way to connect with people and real scientific research you can do. So um, as you're watching this presentation, if you'd like, we'd love if you could um, tweet the hashtag SitSciMonth or post it on your Facebook, post it on your Instagram. You can use any of our graphics that we have on SciStarter. You can find those on citizenscienceMonth.org to share your excitement about SitSciMonth. You can see um, this, little, this scientist right here, this citizen scientist, she's collecting data to help generate an accurate water supply map. So you go, Sienna, um, be like her. But yeah, feel free to share your excitement about this presentation. We'll do our best to um, amplify your message by sharing it from the Science Partner accounts as well. So these are our awesome presenters. We have Susan Tate and Grayson Graham from Earth Echo. We have Rebecca from Stream Selfie, and we have Dr. Karen Cooper from the Crowd the Tap Project and NC State University. And I am your moderator. I'm Caroline Nickerson. Um, and we are going with the flow for this live streamed event. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll kick it off with a quick poll for everyone who's attending. So I'm going to go to my polls. Um, so our first poll is, have you heard of and or participated in citizen science? So let's launch the poll. And please feel free to vote. We want to hear from you and hear about your experience. Oh my gosh, we're coming in at a strong 100% so far. That's fabulous. All right, we'll keep it going for just another second. And now I'm going to end the poll. I'm sharing my results with you. And yes, 100% of the people here who have voted said that they have heard of and participated in citizen science. They know what it is. Um, they know the drill. They've done a citizen science project. Um, well, hopefully, one of these projects that you hear about today you may not have heard before. Um, before we get to our first presenters, um, which are Susan, and um, uh, Grayson from Earth Echo. So let me go back to Susan's bio slide. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of framing for this event. So the idea came about because I thought, you know, I can still go outside while physically distancing and I love citizen science. So theoretically, maybe I could walk to my local stream. I could do the Earth Echo project um, and then I could take a stream selfie. And after that, I could go home and do crowd the tap. So we're taking you all on this, this journey today too, and we hope that um, during this presentation, you may be inspired to complete one of these projects, um, especially Crowd the Tap, which you can do at home, um, or uh, maybe take a stroll later today to your local stream to get involved in a water citizen science project. So with that framing, um, I'm gonna quickly introduce Susan. So Susan Tate is the Water Challenge Manager at Earth Echo International, and she works out of her virtual office in West Michigan. Um, she has an extensive background in middle school science education and has participated as a teacher fellow on Earth Echo's expedition, Water by Design, and as a mentor on the expedition, Plastic Seeds. Um, and Earth Echo is very youth focused. They really inspire youth leadership to monitor water and take action about water quality. And to that end, we're so honored to have a youth leader with us today, Grayson. Um, Susan, I know, is going to kind of speak first and give the framing on it, and then um, also give Grayson a time to um, speak about his experiences. So I'll just go ahead and stop sharing and hand it over to Susan. Um, for those of you who just came in, our attendees, please drop in the chat a little bit about yourself and any questions you might have. We'll make sure to monitor it during the webinar. So Susan, you ready to go? I am just presenting. All right, can you see my screen? We can see it. Awesome, okay. So thank you so much, Caroline, for inviting uh, me on here today. And I would like to share some information about the Earth Echo Water Challenge along with Grayson. 
And I really wanted to go out to the stream today and actually take you there with my phone, but I wasn't really sure it was going to work. And it also was snowing. So I thought I would just bring some water back and we're going to, we're going to work through a demo of the water test kit here in just a moment. Um, so just really quickly for people who may not know, Earth Echo International is a 501c3 nonprofit. It was founded by Philippe and Alexandra Cousteau in honor of their father, Philippe Cousteau Sr., who is the son of legendary ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau. Um, Earth Echo's mission is to inspire young people worldwide to act now for a sustainable future. So we have 21st century tools and interactive resources to equip young people uh, to identify and solve environmental challenges in their own community. And the Earth Echo Water Challenge is just one of our programs that we have. It's our longest running uh, signature program. Um, it officially kicks off on World Water Day, which is March 22nd, and it runs through December. But the point of it is to equip um, people to protect their water resources that uh, they depend on every day. Um, so I'm going to start out with a poll question. So my poll question is, what is your experience level monitoring water quality? So for those of you watching at home, uh, there's some choices here. Are you like super experienced? You know, as the kids say, I'm the CEO of water testing. Uh, or are you, um, you've done it a few times and so you at least look like you know what you're doing. Uh, maybe you've seen it, you've tried it, but you're not really sure if you're doing this right. And then choice D is not a clue, but I'm really excited to jump in and learn. So we'll give you a few minutes, not a few minutes, a little bit of time here to vote. Um, About half the participants have voted. Um, and for those of you watching on Facebook, I know you're not able to vote in the Zoom, but please like drop in the Facebook comments um, your answers to these questions. We still really want to hear from you. So far, we have a majority for not a clue, but I'm excited to jump in, which is what we love to hear. Um, I'm gonna end polling in three, two, last chance, one. Share results. Awesome. So lots of people on today who are excited to learn more. That's what the the former teacher in me is excited to hear. So, um, and if there's if there's anything that you know you need more detail on it, um, you know, add a comment into the chat, um, or I will provide my contact information, and you can certainly reach out to me um, later with questions. Okay, so I here's another question. This one's not a poll question, but if you'd like to drop your answer in the chat box, which might be to the right or below your slide. Um, why is it important for people to monitor the quality of their water? What would you think are some important reasons for that? And Carolina, I can't see the chat window, so I'm hoping you might share a few answers with me. Definitely. Um, so far, we have Liz. She's a Girl Scout troop leader. Um, and they're completing their Think Like a Citizen Science Leadership Journey on SciStarter, which Earth Echo mm -hmm. is part of. That's exciting. Yes, nice. <laughs> um, Emily says that she wants to monitor the quality of our water because it's all the water we have. That is true. Yvette says she wants to stay healthy, and that's why she's monitoring the quality of water. Uh, Liz says you want to know about contaminants, protozoans, bacteria, pollutants. And then Chris said, as a matter of public health, it is vital to monitor water quality. Lisa told us water quality monitoring helps measure whether protections are working. And then I think this is our last submission we'll take from the audience right now. Erica from Alaska says, helps monitor health of local ecosystems. Excellent. Those are all really, really great points that people are bringing up. Um, you know, when I think about water, um, these are just some pictures I've taken. Some have my family members in them. Um, you know, I live right on Lake Michigan, so in the Great Lakes watershed, and, you know, we spend our time in water, whether it's swimming, boating, um, fishing, you know, kayaking, recreating in it. We watch, you know, watch ocean animals and lake animals swimming in it, and of course we eat things that live in the water, uh, like fish, so it is a matter of, you know, public health, just like people uh, commented, so it's, it's a vital resource. Um, you know, that we have. And, you know, as we look at some of the headlines around the world, you know, in the news today, whether it's, you know, state, 
national or international news. Um, you know, it, it just shows that why our planet's water resources face many challenges. So we see stories like these highlighting these challenges and the importance um, for each of us to take an active role in protecting our local water resources. Um, so today we're going to, like I said before, we're going to dive into a demonstration of the Earth Echo Water Challenge and we're going to use some water that was taken from a stream in my community. Um, and hopefully after seeing this demonstration, it'll look like something fun that you want to try and I invite you to consider monitoring a body of surface water that is local to you. Um, and I will give you some information about the kit that I'm using today, although you don't have to use the exact same kit that I'm, I'm going to take you through. Um, but through your participation in the Water Challenge, you join over 1.6 million people around the world who've taken action to monitor water quality in 146 different countries. Together, you'll have the opportunity to test the quality of local surface water, share your data through the Earth Echo Water Challenge Global Database, and discuss strategies to take action to protect your local waterway. So that test, share, protect is kind of our little mantra for the Water Challenge. Um, so this is a look at the kit that I'm going to be using today. These uh, kits are made by Lamotte, so some of you may have some experience with um, this particular water testing kit. And these are for testing surface water sources, not specifically for testing your tap water, um, but you can test them in freshwater or saltwater environments. And there's two types of kits that uh, we we sell on our website through Lama, and that is a basic kit, which is what I'm going to show you today. It basically has one set of testing hardware, and it has enough reagents uh, for pH and dissolved oxygen to run 50 tests. Uh, for teachers, um, ordering a classroom kit, uh, that contains five sets of testing hardware, and then the same number of reagents as the basic kit. And um, you can order these kits on our website at monitorwater.org slash order dash kits. Um, and they are, just to kind of let you know, one basic kit is 13 25 plus shipping. A classroom kit is $53 plus shipping. And then internationally, you can get a, a quote for international shipping. But we do have a kit donation program on our website. There is a place where you can apply for a donated kit. And we do that quarterly if the cost of the kit is going to be prohibitive for you. So anyways, um, that's just a little overview of the kit and what it tests for. Um, I did wanna talk really briefly um, to kind of extend what Caroline was saying about doing the citizen science during the time of these social distancing guidelines. And really there's a lot of the, the safety sort of things with water testing are sort of in effect all of the time. There's just a few key differences. Um, so probably the main one is, you know, we always say it's a good idea to, if you're in, on, or near water, that you have someone with you, um, you know, just for safety purposes. Well, you know, right now with the COVID-19 guidelines, that buddy that you're taking should be a member of your immediate family, someone who's living in your household so that you're not coming into contact with um, someone else and potentially um, spreading that. So Still a great idea to take someone with you, but you know you can take your mom, your dad, son, daughter, someone who's living in your house um, to do that. Um, you know we always talk with water testing about making sure that you know you you know if it's private property, do you have permission to be on the site where the stream is or the lake? Um, I think the difference now is you also have to consider if it's a public space like a park. You know is that park closed right now? Is it open? Are you supposed to be there? Um, so just making sure that where you want to go to test water, that it's a place that is accessible right now and safe for you to go to. So you're making sure that um, there's an easy access point for collecting the water as well. Um, and then you know, if a lot of times people go do water testing and they see some trash laying around and they want to kind of do a little beach sweep or a, a cleanup along the stream. And right now, you know, even more than normal, it's probably a good idea to wear some gloves if you're planning on picking up litter. Uh, and then, of course, it's always a good idea to wash your hands after you handle water you know, from the stream because you don't really know what could possibly be in it. And then it's extra good advice right now to do that. All right, so this is the stream that I visited. And don't let those blue skies deceive you. It is very cloudy today. I took these pictures yesterday. I went out, and Rebecca, you'd be really happy to know that I did register it with Stream Selfie while I was there. 
Um, and just to kind of show you on a map where I'm located in Michigan, uh, this is a little stream called Coon Creek. And it's a nice shallow little stream. It kind of winds through some agricultural private land, um, some public spaces. Uh, you can see it has a nice sort of sandy bottom right where we are there. Um, bonus points for anyone who can identify that flower in the lower right corner of the picture, the, the biggest picture there, that really unusual looking thing. Caroline, you'll have to tell me if anybody puts in the chat what that is, if they know, if you can identify it. I think everybody's stumped so far. <laughs> Do we have any, someone says it looks carnivorous. Ooh, is it? It does. It does look carnivorous. It's not, but it, it's kind of, it's, it's a plant called a skunk cabbage. <gasps> Andrea had it right. She posted skunk, cag ca skunk oh, cabbage right before you said that. So I learned a lot about them yesterday when I was, I was just curious about, I knew what they were called, but I didn't know much about them, but that's the, the flower coming up. It flowers first and then the leaves come later and they're really common in wetland areas. Um, but it, if you cut into the flower, it smells sort of like a skunk and that attracts the flies and things that are going to pollinate it. And it actually is a thermogenic plant. So it, it gives off, it has chemical reactions that it heats it up like up to 40 degrees warmer than the air temperature, which I thought was really interesting. But the flies appreciate that it smells really gross and skunky. So, anyways. All right, so we're, uh, these are the four tests that I'm going to do really quickly here with the kit. Um, we're gonna test for temperature, turbidity, pH, and dissolved oxygen. So we do have some resources on our website. If you go to monitorwater.org and you click on the link for tools, there are some, um, some, some activity guides and things that'll kind of take you through these in a little bit more detail. Um, I do want to say that the, the little booklet that comes with the kit, um, which I'll we'll spotlight in just a moment, does have some more information inside about these tests, and I'll, I'll talk about them a little bit as I, as I do them. So, Caroline, if you want to spotlight my camera here. Kind of Great. And if you through. stop sharing your screen, your camera will be the, the main thing we see. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> And there we so, go, we can see you. So I'm, I'm learning how to set this up here. And, and the biggest thing is it's upside down for me, but it's right side up for you. So I may be on the struggle bus a little bit a couple of times. So I will try to keep track of that. Um, so here's the, the kit right here. Here's the part that I went and I collected some water about 30 minutes before the call. And I did, um, well, I'll tell you here in a second, but so these are some of the kit items uh, in front of us here. So the first test that we do is for temperature. And for temperature, the basic idea here is that you just, you go to the stream and the first thing, well, let me show you that, I guess this will come out on the side here. So when you get your kit, there's these um, little temperature stickers that you put on the side of your kit. Um, and there's one for, this top one here is for lower temperatures, which is very helpful in Michigan this time of year. And then you go to your stream and you can actually do this right from the stream bank or the side of the lake, um, unless you have waders or something like that. And you're just gonna fill the container with water and then you cap it. And if I was outside, I would actually then submerge this in the water and you let it, you know, about 10 centimeters down and you let it acclimate for about a minute. So I brought this home. Again, this was about 45 minutes ago, maybe. I brought it home and I put it in my fridge. Um, but you can see on here, uh, the temperature right now uh, is about 10 degrees Celsius. But when I was at the stream, it was um, six degrees Celsius. So it, it's pretty close. It might affect our dissolved oxygen just a little bit, um, but the, the stream was nice and cold. And of course, cold streams um, are really good for the, the things that are living in it. A lot of the fish and the macroinvertebrates like the water to be cold because cold um, water is going to have a lot of dissolved oxygen for them. So um, also I wanted to point out that in this little, booklet that comes with your kit. Let's see if I can kind of get this under here. There is a spot for each time you go out or to each different site where you can record your information. So I just haven't put that in there yet. Um, air temperature is also on there, which I got from my car as I was driving there. It was 39 degrees Fahrenheit, which I need to convert into Celsius to put on here, but it's very cold. So those of you watching from places that are warmer than Michigan, I'm really jealous right now. Anyway, so temperature is just a matter of reading the little thing on the side. And then the second parameter is turbidity. 
Um, so you can see that some of the debris that I collected when I got my water has sort of settled out. Um, so if you do this like right away at the stream and those particles are more suspended, um, you'll probably have a, a slightly more accurate value, but you've, this little card comes with your kit. And so you kind of just hold it, Let's see if I can hold that right. So you just kind of hold it and you look and you see which one it's closer to. Um, turbidity is a measure of how clear the water is. So if it's really clear water, it's gonna have low turbidity. And if it's really cloudy water, it's going to have a higher turbidity value. Um, so this water right now looks pretty clear, partly because some of the sediment has settled. But you know, when you're looking at that, maybe it looks maybe like this middle value here, pretty good. So, um, so that's just a measure of turbidity. By the way, um, when I was teaching, I raised salmon, uh, Chinook salmon eggs in my classroom. And, and fish like salmon really like nice clear streams, not cloudy, because um, you know, cloudy water can cover their eggs with silt and cause suffocation. Um, cloudy water, high turbidity also tends to make the stream warm up more. And, um, and then that's going to lower the dissolved oxygen. So clear water is preferred for a lot of the things that are, are living in it. All right, so the next two tests are chemical tests. And um, I'm going to do dissolved oxygen first. So with that one, you get this little teeny bottle like this. And you're just going to dip it in your sample. And you want to kind of make sure that as you lift it up, that the water's all the way to the top. You can see that. And then you're going to take, it comes with these little tabs. Um, and like I always tell my students, make sure you're using the right chemical here. So for the dissolved oxygen, you're actually going to use two tabs. And so we'll poke these out of this little. And like I said, there's enough chemicals here to run. Oops, <laughs> it's floating on top. So you're gonna put these two tablets in and when you put those in, it's gonna overflow, which is what you want it to do. And then you're gonna put the cap on it. And that's also gonna cause it to overflow a little bit. And the reason is if you have air bubbles inside, um, as you're shaking it, you're gonna invert and shake it for about four minutes, um, you're introducing more oxygen into the water. So you're not gonna get an accurate result. So you basically shake this for four minutes until the tablets are dissolved. It might take a little more than four minutes and then you're gonna let it sit and it has a five minute reaction time. So just like on the Food Network, <laughs> I prepped some ahead of time. So magically, we have one done. Um, so I don't know, this might be a little harder to read with the lighting here, but so you're gonna compare it to these these dots over here. Um, so it's, it's hard to see, but it's, closer to the eight parts per million. And so you want it to be a higher value for dissolved oxygen because again, that's what the things in the stream or the lake really uh, would like so that they have oxygen to breathe. Um, so you can kind of see that the tablets have disappeared. So it's pretty close to eight parts per million. You know, if you think, well, it's kind of in between four and eight and I want to call it six, that's fine. You can do that too. Um, so, and then the last one here to demonstrate, oh, it's also a good idea to, have some paper towels or something to wipe up when you're spilling water everywhere. So the last one here is uh, pH. And pH is, you know, a measure of how acidic or basic the water is. Um, for those of you not as familiar with the pH scale, numbers that are higher are more basic, numbers that are lower are more acidic. Um, neutral is seven. And so if, if I did this with tap water, I should get a seven approximately. Um, and we'll see, you know, if there's some acidity or some, it's basic in the water. Um, you know, and that can come from things like acid rain or pollution going into a stream. Um, or it can actually come from the bedrock um, of your area. So Michigan has a lot of limestone. So a lot of our streams and lakes tend to actually be a little bit more alkaline or basic um, because of that limestone. So again, you, you take your little, this one is the, the taller reaction tile here. And for this one, it doesn't matter if there's a little bit of air at the top of it um, because it's not like the dissolved oxygen where we're testing that. So then you get your pH tablet, drop that in, tap it, and then you just basically do the invert shake until it dissolves. And then you're going to compare it on your color chart. And through modern magic here, we have one already done. And so we can kind of look at this. And so as you're looking, it's kind of hard to see here. Um, you know, the seven is, is sort of a greenish yellow. And 
mine is a little bit closer to that straight green for eight. So, which doesn't surprise me, like I said, Michigan streams and lakes tend to be a little bit more basic, um, but you should probably find it in that seven to eight range. Um, so that is just kind of an overview of how the test kit works. But like I said, you don't, ha you know, when you, when you go, if we'll talk about entry data, if you go to enter data, you don't have to use this particular kit. Um, I've used like the hot colorimeters before, you might have probe wear. Um, you can go out with a thermometer and some pH paper and just, you know, do those parameters if you want. Um, but like I said, these kits are available. You can order them on our website at monitorwater.org. And it's a pretty simple, straightforward thing. So once you have your data, and I'm going to go back to my slideshow, Caroline. And actually, we're um, all have five minute warning for you and Grace. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm just going to show you these last couple slides of mine really quickly, and then um, Grayson, let's see here. All right. So once you have your, your water testing data that you've collected, a really big part of the water challenge is to go onto our website at monitorwater.org, and you can add your results in. So if you've been to that stream before and you've already created a, a login and a site, you can just add your results. Um, if not, you have to create an account and, and just put the site in there. And then that's how people around the world can actually ac access your data as well. Um, and then the final piece, which leads nicely into what Grayson's going to talk about, is um, when you find that there's something maybe wrong at the stream or lake where you're monitoring, you know, what can you do to, to fix that problem? Um, and so like in non-COVID-19 times, that could involve getting together and doing a tree planting or something like that. Um, you know, in, in these times of social distancing, it's probably much better to do something like a letter writing campaign. Uh, writing to your, you know, your legislators or doing a pledge that you can send to people online. So there's still a lot of options and you can go to monitorwater. Dot, oh, I, I typed that wrong. Sorry. Monitorwater.org slash protect for more ideas. But Grayson is going to talk a little bit about his experience with the water challenge as one of our youth leaders. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Grayson Graham. I've been with Earth Echo for three years now. They really are a great organization and they've given me so many opportunities with the water challenge to go out in my community and not only teach youth but teach privileged youth that don't know much about science and so it's really just been an awesome past three years just being able to do that um i started uh, water testing at a summer camp in my local area about four or five years ago and i sort of learned about earth echo through that and i applied for their water challenge ambassadorship which the applications are up right now. So if you're interested, um, they're on this slide, go to Earth Echo. I mean, www.monitorwater.org slash ambassadors. And uh, that's how I first got involved. And I later became a leadership council member and the other link is up there as well. But as I've gone through the past five years of water um, quality testing in my community, I've learned a bunch, um, not only about Greenville, North Carolina, which is where I live, but really about the people there. and. One of the things I found is that water quality testing, and I'm, this time it's probably not the greatest, but it's really a community, a community event. You can get uh, decent sized groups of uh, people together to go test water quality and learn. And you really realize that people actually care about this and that you're just, you're not alone, that you can get people together and go out and have fun while testing. And that's another thing is that it's, while it's about science, it's also about having fun. Um, one of the most important things is that while you're doing this, you want to have a good time. You want to enjoy yourself while you're doing it. But testing water quality, like I said, it's opened up so many awesome opportunities. North Echo is a great organization to go through to um, test water quality. Um, over the past three years, I've had opportunities like going to meet Neil Bush with one of my local organizations, going to the Georgia Aquarium and meeting some of the uh, people there. And you just, it opens up so many doors. Um, the summer camps I was talking about a little bit earlier, uh, I've taught over a thousand underprivileged youth about water quality. And like I said, I mean, it, I can't stress it enough that if you are interested in, if you are interested in doing something, you go and apply for, a, for our ambassadorship or to become a wild, a wild sea member because you can really impact the lives of people around you in your community. And it's, it's really more than just citizen science. It's helping your community too. So if you are interested, go check it out. It's a great thing to do. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you to Grayson for all the work you do and to Susan as well.
All right. And if people go to earthecho.org, they can find out about all the programs, including the Youth Leadership Council that Grayson is on, and all the application materials are up there for interested students. Great. And before we toss it to Rebecca, we had two questions come in, in the chat. Um, Erica was wondering if you could still order kits um, in light of current public health concerns, like if they're still shipping out. Absolutely. Yep. There's Lamont is still working on that, so kits can be ordered for sure. Great. And then Catherine was wondering, do you all have recommendations for more advanced testing kits, like for nitrates and phosphates? So on the, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, on the monitorwater.org, when you go to enter your data, um, there you can add additional stuff like testing for nitrates and, and phosphorus. And, you know, there can be macroinvertebrate um, observations. There's spaces where you can upload pictures, um, you know, weather, site data, land usage. There's a lot more things you can put in there, yes. Great. All right. Well, um, we're going to toss it to Rebecca now. You, Re Rebecca, are you ready for us? Yeah, let me just uh, get my screen going here. All right. Great. Rebecca is um, with the Isaac Walton League, but I'll let her introduce herself. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. It's been um, really cool to meet all these different folks connected through SciStarter, especially in the water world. It's a weird combination of feeling less connected in some ways, but more connected in other ways. So thank you for bringing us together and having us you know, be able to share between our different groups. Um, so I'm Rebecca Shore. I'm the Save Our Streams coordinator for the Mid-Atlantic for the Isaac Walton League of America. And we have a number of different clean water programs that we run. So the primary focus of my job is particularly Save Our Streams, which is our program that's macroinvertebrate monitoring or chemical monitoring, um, particularly in my area in Virginia and Maryland. But we also have a bunch of other programs that you've probably heard of. I know that there's a couple of folks here already who have heard of Stream Selfie, which is very exciting. Uh, we also have Salt Watch, our winter salt watch program, which is monitoring salt levels in streams during the winter. So road salt, once it's applied on roads, washes into streams and creeks. And that, of course, can make it Toxic and toxic environment for our macroinvertebrates, and then we also have um, our chemical monitoring. There's lots of different ways to get involved, but today we're going to be talking about Stream Selfie, which is a great project both in these times to be able to go out and engage in water quality monitoring while social distancing, and it's also a way for folks to get involved with just starting to plug in with their local waterways. You know, figuring out. What streams are nearby? Where does your drinking water come from? Why are your streams important? Um, and so it's a great way to sort of get kids outside, get everyone outside and start to pay attention to what's important to us. What are the streams and creeks that uh, are meaningful to us and why they're worth saving? All right, so a lot of you or a few of you are familiar with Stream Selfie already, but for those of you who aren't, um, it's been around for a few years. We have, I believe, over 2,000 um, submitted Stream Selfies, which is great um, from all across the world. I was just checking today. We have some from Uganda. From We have someone on vacation in Italy and Iceland. Um, so we have photos from coming in from all over the world um, of people's favorite streams. And so to get involved with Stream Selfie, it's pretty easy. If you don't already have a SciStarter account, I'm sure you will by the end of the day today, since you're gonna hear about so many great programs. So you just search for the Stream Selfie project page or go to streamselfie.org, and it'll take you right to this page where you can participate and add your Stream Selfie to our maps. Um, so once you hit participate, um, you'll be able to share your image that you've taken. And so a couple things about taking a stream selfie. It doesn't have to be a selfie, so don't feel pressured when you go out that you know you have to really have your selfie game on and look really good when you're out in the field. Um, you can always just take a picture of your favorite stream or maybe your favorite animal companion um, enjoying the stream and upload that. So we have, of course, just some beautiful nature photos as well as some really great selfies. And once you go onto the platform to add your selfie, um, you're going to see a couple of questions that we ask about your stream. And the reason why we ask these questions is that we're trying to build a map, not just of where do people recreate and enjoy their streams, but also what are places we can maybe prioritize as monitoring sites, um, give us information about intermittent and ephemeral streams, 
and also create maps um, about where people are and where they're going out. So, for example, we ask about if it, is it private or public land? And as Susan mentioned, especially in times right now, it's important to figure out that you're accessing somewhere that's safe and that you're allowed to go there. Um, and then one of the really interesting things we've been looking at is the amount of trash. So of course, when you go out, um, unfortunately, a lot of times you might see trash when, you out, when you're out of the stream. Um, I visited my local stream. I'm in Silver Spring, Maryland, and there's all this trash out there. Um, so of course, a really great activity you can do during these times, as Susan mentioned, is pick up trash um, when you're out there. And so if you go out and you know that there's a lot of trash and you decide to do a clean up, clean up you can always do a before and after selfie of you with what you picked up. Um, and we also ask about if the stream flows continuously. And this is actually more important than it used to be um, in some ways. So some streams are ephemeral or intermittent. They don't flow year round. And that's really important to know because there's actually been recent changes to the Clean Water Act and certain streams have lost protection that they used to have. So some people might think that these intermittent or ephemeral streams aren't really important to water quality or to our drinking water, and they really are. So that's something we want to keep track of is how many streams out there are not flowing year round but are still contributing to our watersheds. So that's another thing that we ask about. And with all these different questions, you can always put you don't know. So don't feel pressure that you have to know everything about your stream uh, when you head out into the field. We are trying to get as much data as possible, but of course, you know, don't let that be a barrier to participating. So these are just some examples of stream selfies we've gotten over time, as you can see. Sometimes they feature canines, sometimes they just feature a beautiful, you know, water feature. So um, they're definitely a really fun activity. The group in the middle, they're of course also doing macroinvertebrate monitoring. So if you're already going to go out and monitor, it's a great chance to document it and show what you're doing. And of course, with social distancing, a thing to keep in mind is if you're going to go out with a group and you're going to take a group selfie, make sure that the group is in your own household, you know don't necessarily bring all your friends together and take a group selfie really close to each other right now. So if you're going to go out with your friends and family or your other housemates, definitely grab that group shot. But of course, um, you know, be careful when you're out there taking your pictures. And as I said, don't let the term selfie deter you. Um, you can absolutely just take a picture of your stream and send it our way. So we started building some pretty cool maps from this information. So first off, this is just our map of the US of where we've gotten selfies. So it's all over the country. Um, definitely some regions, Montana, we need a couple more stream selfies in there, but you can, you know, all across the country, we're getting pictures from all over. And it's really cool. You can explore this map um, right now and see the different pictures coming in. This project is a, we're very proud. Um, a lot of girl and Boy Scout groups really have taken this project on and we have lots of great pictures. Um, I was recently looking through pictures from one of our troops in Hawaii and they did a really great job talking about why is their stream important and why do they want to protect it. So this is a really fun program for folks of all ages, young and old, um, and they're coming in from all over. And this is one of the maps that we've put, to get, put together with some of our data. So this is the trash data that I mentioned. And of course, the big red dots are areas with lots of trash, moderate, minimal, or none. And this will help us maybe prioritize where do we want to send out volunteers or if you want to figure out a place to go out and pick up trash, you can use this map um, and be able to figure out, well, there's an area with a lot of trash near me. I'm going to go out and pick up trash. So there's actually a lot of data that we can use from this, which is really exciting. And um, we're looking at things, like I said, ephemeral streams, trash, where can we send out monitors? All that stuff will be really useful. And also just a great way to start engaging with your local waterway and maybe inspire a budding citizen scientist to start paying attention to water quality and why it's important locally. So uh, this is a stream selfie I snapped last week um, at Sligo Creek. So it's really easy to do. You can do it straight from your smartphone or you can take a picture of your camera and upload it on your computer. And we've started featuring our favorite selfies every week on our social media. So on Instagram or Facebook for at Save Our Streams. So definitely take the opportunity, you know, if you're going out for a walk today, snap a selfie, send it in. Um, and, you know, hopefully this is a great way to at least get a little enjoyment from being out in nature and have a little connection both with your stream and with your community. And yeah, I hope to see your selfie 
out there on the map and maybe you'll be featured. Um, if you are especially, you know, goofy, excited, if you've got a really nice shot, to keep an eye on our social media channels. And uh, Caroline, I think you wanted to attempt a uh, group Zoom selfie today. Let's do it. So Rebecca is going to take a selfie of the panelists. So Rebecca, if you stop sharing your screen for a second. Yeah, so I don't have a selfie of myself taking a selfie of myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see if we have any questions come through before we do that. Um, yeah. Questions, but we got a cool comment from Liz. It's fun fact yeah. that sunscreen selfie is also part of the Girl Scouts journey on SciStarter. Woo! Liz was saying that she's really pleased to be part of this conversation because she's getting a lot of great ideas about things her troop can do while self-isolating. Nice, perfect. Yeah, and if you've already, if you've taken one stream self at your stream, you can t also take them over time. You can take more than one, different angles, you know, just because we have one doesn't mean that's all the information we need. Streams change over time, so you might go out one day and it looks totally different, or if you go out another day, you might know something new, so it's definitely can keep doing it, can do it every week, do it every day. It's, um, it's a, you know, they're constantly changing. And um, I'm actually gonna take the selfie really quickly because I have us all on gallery view. So panelists, ha, perfect. smile. <laughs> okay, I took the selfie and it'll be tweeted Love on Starter's Twitter and all, our, all of our other social media networks. Perfect, thank you. And it's not, there's no stream, but we're, we're making it work. <laughs> We'll just draw in a little, <laughs> little one. <laughs> Great. Well, we're going to move on to um, Dr. Karen Cooper now. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you. All right, and Karen, you are muted. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, I'll share some slides, too. It'll just take me a sec. Um, but I love hearing about all these projects to monitor fresh water. Um, because after we monitor and protect our fresh water in our rivers and streams and lakes, then it eventually travels right into our homes, <laughs> right, and becomes our drinking water, and we still need to monitor and protect it at our taps. And that's the focus with Crowd the Tap. Um, and this project is totally okay with social distancing and the stay-at-home orders. Um, because it's done right at home. <laughs> the most you might have to do is go into your cellar. Hold on, okay, so sharing, I don't know why I'm not seeing. The share button is up. I can also share your slides for you if you'd like. Yeah, no, I'm just not seeing my, I see a bunch of options. Oh, show all windows. No, it's showing my windows. Why is it not sh files? No, advanced. I'll just share no? your slides and you can tell me um, next slide and all that fun stuff. Does that work? Okay, yeah, it feels so weird. I shared it earlier and now it's not, I don't know why it's not coming up as a share option. Oh, there it is. Wait, wait, I think I have it. Okay. I can do it. I really can. Yeah. Thank you for being patient. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so here we go. Is it going? We are, yep, we're in business. Okay, great. Um, right, so Crowd the Tap uh, is focused on safe drinking water in the United States. Um, and like I said, it it's really is a great way. I like the way you've structured this um, live stream because it's a great way to culminate really thinking about being involved in Earth Echo Challenge and Stream Selfie and going from protecting, monitoring and protecting those water sources to monitoring and protecting what's really coming out of our faucets. Um, and so what we're focused on really is some of the a major source of risk with drinking water, which is lead in water. Because the risk of lead in drinking water, really it doesn't, it, it comes basically from the pipes that transport water to the tap. Um, so, uh, so we can do a lot to protect um, pollution and other contaminants from affecting our freshwater bodies. Um, and that's great and necessary, but even if we do that perfectly, <laughs> there's still going to be some risks just from our infrastructure. Uh, so anyway, I wanted to just get a sense of where people are at with their drinking water. Um, and so if you go to that first poll, or the next poll, I mean, uh, Caroline, um, that just asks people uh, how much they trust the drinking water. 
uh, yeah, if you trust the drinking water in your home is, if you think it's, if you feel that it's safe. All right, so far we have 60% yes, 10% no, and 30% maybe, I'm not sure. Um, I'm gonna close down polling in three, two, last chance to vote. Come on, let's get these votes in. And one, we end our poll and share results. All right, okay, so it ended up being just about half said yes, great. Um, a, a few that said no and some that said maybe. And, um, and I think, uh, yeah, that, that's like a pretty good range. I think there's always reason for caution. Um, and uh, I'll just, I made a little timeline just related to some of the legislation, different laws, federal laws passed related to protecting our drinking water. And, uh, and it really, you can see here just briefly, it really wasn't until uh, 1948 that there was a federal law even related to sort of, um, sort of related to, to water protection. Because after, before that, it was very much just each city or state, whatever, did things on their own. Um, it was in the 70s that the Clean Water Act was passed, right? That is informing a lot of the work of the monitoring of fresh water bodies. And in 74, that the Safe Drinking Water Act was passed. And that's the laws that protect um, drinking water. And then, um, and then there was various, uh, revisions to that and also the lead and copper rule and whatnot. Anyway, and so it really wasn't um, until 1986 that um, lead pipes was banned from use in our drinking water systems. Now, most, a lot of places already started not using lead because they were aware of the problems with lead pipes, but it really wasn't officially banned until 1986. And then it really wasn't until 2014 with the implementation of the reduction in lead and drinking water act that lead was um, reduced in faucets. So, because uh, part of brass faucets. So my point here really is that most of the water, or a lot of the water infrastructure, the pipes that are bringing water to our homes was put in the ground for a lot of us well before this timeline even begins. <laughs> So, so there's a lot of infrastructure and it's buried underground, it's out of sight, it's out of mind, um, that was put in place uh, before we started banning the use of lead. And it was put in place before we were really keeping very good records. So there's not even really good records of where there are um, different types of pipes that might cause different types of hazards. And so um, Crowd the Tap is focused on protecting safe drinking water, but by understanding the pipes and the infrastructure that are present. Um, and so I'm curious to know how many people attending know, already know the types of pipes that are in your home delivering drinking water to your faucets. So, so far um, we have 57% saying no, they don't know what type. 10% uh, say maybe, I'm not sure, and 23% say yes. Yeah, and um, that seems pretty representative <laughs> of what I've encountered so far, and it certainly is representative of me before I began getting involved in this project, that most of us uh, don't, um, don't know much about our water infrastructure, right? It's not typically stuff we learn in school. It's not something we often have to encounter. Um, unless we have like a plumbing emergency. And so, uh, so with Crowd the Tap, one of the things um, that you'll learn <laughs> is really what types of pipes are in your home. Now, if you do already know, you can start Crowd the Tap right now and pretty much answer all the questions that are uh, part of the site. I'm gonna go through those in a minute. Um, and if you don't know, then there's a, um, a lot of, tips about how to learn what types of pipes are in your house. And, and the projects asked about um, the plumbing in the house that brings water to the faucet, as well as the service line. Here, I'll go to the next slide. Oh, uh, that brings, sorry, uh, I wasn't presenting that the way I went. Uh, this, oops, the service line 
I'm <laughs> sorry. That brings, uh, so this little diagram just shows sort of underground what we often don't, what we don't see, right? So there's a water main that's coming from the utility provider, assuming for all of us who are not on well water, I think there's about 10 or 15% of the population is on directly have their own private wells. So most of us have uh, a water utility and there's a water main, it's often buried under the streets and it's connected to a service line through what's called a gooseneck, which is sort of um, just a little bit of connector pipe. Um, and then the service line, part of it is on is publicly owned on public property, but then as soon as it crosses onto private property, it becomes privately owned. It's the responsibility of the, the property owner. And then that enters a house and then is connected to the home plumbing. And so um, in terms of risk of lead and water and the, and the pipes, there's been a fair bit of attention paid to schools because children are at such high risk when it comes to lead and tap water. There's been a bit of attention paid to the public utilities and their, their role in replacing infrastructure, but there hasn't been a lot of attention to homes. And so we're trying to really work with homeowners um, because this part of the, the home plumbing and the service line on private property really is the responsibility of homeowners um, to manage to reduce the risk of lead in tap water. And so uh, what we encourage people to do is to find where their shutoff valve is for their water to their home. Um, it might be in the cellar. It could be in a lot of, a few different places. Um, and, uh, but basically if you were to have a water emergency, like a leak, you'd wanna be able to shut off that valve. I mean, if you can find that, then basically one side of that is typically where the service line is coming in. And then the rest is what's leading to your home plumbing. And um, with a penny and a magnet, it's really easy then to figure out what type of pipes those are. Um, and so this is sort of our diagram for how to do that. You can take a refrigerator magnet. Um, we have little kits, little crowd the tap kits that have a penny and a magnet. Um, but you can, um, with a magnet, if you, if you try to put the magnet on the pipe and it sticks, then it's a steel pipe. Um, now steel pipes could still be lined with lead. They, there's still risk there, but anyway, but it is a steel pipe if the magnet sticks. Um, if it doesn't stick, there's three different, uh, three, we're basically saying there's sort of three different categories of pipes that are, remain. Um, and you could take a penny and scratch them. If it scratches to be the color, same color as that penny, then it's a copper pipe. Now copper pipes, um, um, up until more recent decades where the solder used was often lead. So there can also be risks there, even with a copper pipe. Um, if it scratches and it's, there's no shine to it whatsoever, it's a plastic pipe. Um, and if it really makes a silver streak, and it's almost kind of soft, that's a lead pipe. Um, and then uh, what, what we really encourage people to do um, is to report that information to Crowd the Tap. And I'm just, just gonna show uh, sort of what that website looks like to show you some of the resources there and how easy it is to participate. So um, it's crowdthetap.org, um, crowdthetap.org, takes you here to this, um, to part of SciStarter. Um, I wanted to just, to, there's a, a video explaining the project. Um, there are lesson plans for teachers, um, high school, uh, and undergraduate level um, educators, uh, and I encourage it for families too. Lessons um, related to drinking water, to chemistry, really good stuff there. I encourage you to check out. Um, and then uh, at the bottom of that page too, there's um, just sort of a graph that continues to update about what people are finding in terms of the, the types of pipes, and there's some FAQs. Um, now the main part, is there's two other parts, which one is to report data and the other is a forum to talk about um, findings and to help each other find their pipes. Um, and the report data has these um, different tabs. And uh, the first part is a consent page, which basically explains sort of the purpose of Crowd the Tap and how you will use, how the data will be used by researchers and how it will confidentially be shared um, for other purposes. And at the bottom of that page, you can consent. 
um, and you can decide your privacy settings. You can decide whether you want your name public so we can publicly acknowledge and thank you for being part of the effort or if you'd rather your name to just remain private. Either way, we don't associate your name with your data. Um, and, uh, and then the next tab is about your home. And this is where you provide information about your address and about your household characteristics. About the age of the home is really important um, as part of this. Um, and also if there's vulnerable populations like um, infants and young children in the house. And then there's a simple tab on your pipes asking about the home plumbing, what the results were if you did a magnet uh, test or not, or a scratch test, what the results were. Um, and also, but basically asking what pipes you have. Um, and then uh, we asked that about the service line as well. Then um, there's some basic observations about your water, about its taste, if there's an odor, a color, if there's any particulates in it, and those kind of things. Now, when it comes to lead as the contaminant, there, you, there's no way you can detect it in your water. It's not visible, it, you can't taste it, all those things. But, um, but we are curious about some of the correlates that might be related to um, and perceptions about water quality that people are experiencing. And that's the core part of Crowd the Tap that relates to sort of our inventory of water pipes. Um, there's another part that is optional that involves um, that we're recruiting, we're hoping to get about a thousand homes to participate that relate to building. Um, yeah, it's kind of a statistical thing. So until we have a way to, um, to accurately test our water at home for lead and water, which we don't, those don't exist right now, the off the shelf kits really aren't good enough right now. Um, so right now we have to send our, our water to a lab to be tested for lead and water. Um, so uh, what we're trying to do is build a model so that we can predict um, whether a home has a high or low risk of lead and water. And so part of what that involves is um, we're hoping, for, like I said, for a thousand homes that provide information about the pipes, do this very simple at home chemistry test. It's really sim similar actually to what you saw with the Earth Echo um, Water Challenge. Um, we can provide these test strips. They're a 14 in one strip. So there's actually 14 different um, tests on this one strip that you dip in your drinking water. And then you can report those here online. And um, so people would report their pipes, report this at home chemistry, and then also um, sign up with this group called Healthy Babies Bright Futures to do a water, a lead and water test in the lab. By signing up, um, and there's a sliding scale, it does cost money for that part, um, to uh, receive um, special water bottles and instructions to take samples from your tap, send them to a lab and get those results. And so the idea is if we have a thousand homes that do those three parts of Crowd the Tap, then we can use that to build a, like a statistical model so that if people only report the pipes and this home water chemistry, we can hopefully reliably predict their risk of lead in tap water. So that's kind of the, the main gist. Anyway, but that last part, like I said, is optional. For many people, we're hoping they, that people contribute just information about their pipes and their homes. Um, and then at the end, it's basically you submit the form. Um, there's some general tips and recommendations at the um, Crowd the Tap site. Um, and then uh, there's also, like I mentioned earlier, a forum uh, where people can, um, can talk with one another. Sort of, it's meant for it to be for community building, for people to talk to each other if they're encountering problems or risk with lead or if they want more clarifications or, um, help finding their pipes, all those kind of things. We want to encourage people to share that on the forum with the crowd, the tap. And uh, so that I will stop sharing if I can figure out, oop, that's not how, how do I stop sharing? Yeah, I gotcha. Um, okay. Thank you so much. There we go. <laughs> so uh, 
anyway, thank you for letting me share that about Crowd the Tap. And uh, yeah, if any questions come up, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, yeah, actually, the the website is crowdthetap.org. That will take you right where you need to go. Um, yeah, and not, for all not the size, not the other one that you listed up there. It's just go right to crowdthetap.org. Mm -hmm. And for all of these projects, you can actually search them on SciStarter. So if you go to SciStarter.org and you use the project finder, you could search Earth Echo and find the water challenge. You could search Stream Selfie and find Stream Selfie. And you could search Crowd the Tap and find Crowd the Tap and hopefully many other opportunities to do citizen science. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Susan, Grayson, Rebecca, and Karen um, for being part of this today. Um, we definitely, as you can tell, we went with the flow, but we still made it. We hit right at the hour for our hour long webinar. So yay for us. Um, I think this is the first webinar I've done, our, sorry, live streamed event I've done where we've actually made it in under time. Um, but yeah, I hope that you all enjoy Citizen Science Month. You can find many more online events and activities at citizenscienceMonth.org. And otherwise, um, I hope that you go on a nice uh, physically distant walk, get to do Earth Echo, take a stream selfie, and then go back home to do Crowd the Tap. Any other words from our panelists before we go today? Just thanks everyone for watching and for you know doing what you do. The power of citizen science cannot be understated. That is so true. And Christopher said, this was really interesting. We're going to use it to promote more citizen science in our area. Savannah said, thank you. You've given some good ideas. Um, and then uh, Karen Cooper said, that's great, Liz. It's super when there is transparency. Yes, I 100% agree. And I applaud all these projects that we spotlighted today and who graciously you know, shared their expertise with us today. They're all really good about um, making their maps available and cluing people into all the different ways they can um, see the water around them and the pipes too. All right, well, I think unless we have any more questions come in on the chat, we'll probably wrap it up here. Last call for questions. Okay, well, um, think I'm gonna quickly stop sharing. I'm do, gonna do one last selfie because um, I'm gonna be selfish about this one because I accidentally got my messy bedroom in last time. So we're gonna do one last selfie for Twitter. This is not a stream selfie, it's just a selfie selfie. Perfect. All right, and let me flip my camera. <laughs> and I'm trying to get my clothes out. I don't do laundry during citizen science month. Okay, here we go. <laughs> we got it. I'm gonna take one of Woo! you guys like this. Awesome. Thank you, Grayson. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Rebecca. I hope you all enjoy Citizen Science Month. We're going to end the meeting now. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Caroline. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.